We'll be talking about the landmark infrastructure bill with Matt Gertkin. He is the vice president of geopolitical strategy at BCA Research and an expert on all things geopolitics and macroeconomics. Welcome back to the show, Matt. Hey, thanks a lot, David. Pleasure to have you as always. Let's talk about what happened this week. The Senate passed $1.2 trillion in the bill. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, so this is a bipartisan infrastructure deal. It still needs to pass the House, but it has passed the Senate with 19 Republican votes. So that is truly bipartisan. They, you know, they needed at least 10 Republicans. And it is a major component of Joe Biden's overall agenda, the Build Back Better agenda, I guess you could call it. Uh, in the hard infrastructure part, roads, bridges, even broadband internet, that's something that is widely agreed on. And so that's why he was able to section this off and do it in a bipartisan way. We still have to see what happens in the House, but it is likely to pass ultimately. Okay, so let's take a look at the table here. Uh, breaking this down, so we've got uh, roads, bridges, transportation, safety, public transport. It looks like uh, most of this will be spent on roads, bridges, and ports. So obviously, pundits will be asking and wondering, is this $550, of, 550 billion dollars rather, of additional spending necessary? Is the infrastructure of America in such disrepair that it warrants $110 billion of spending at a time when we're already at national uh, record levels of national debt? Well, I, I think there have been quite a few studies showing that the U.S. infrastructure is old, outdated, uh, and needs uh, assistance. And there have been high-profile incidents over the past uh, decade that kind of highlight that as well. And you've seen two presidents, you know, President Trump and President Biden, campaigning on big infrastructure packages. Everyone agrees. Look at local government ballot measures. Over 90% of people will vote in favor of higher taxes if it goes directly to their local infrastructure. So yes, mm -hmm. Americans broadly do think they need uh, at least traditional infrastructure, and that's why the Republicans joined on to this. So let's talk about taxes now. You brought that up. Will we see higher taxes to finance this? Generally speaking, how can this be financed? It mostly will not be financed because the Republicans are categorically opposed to tax increases. There are some measures to offset this. They're mostly overrated. Uh, but of the 550 billion, maybe 350 billion um, will will really go directly to the deficit and debt because they won't be financed. That, that's just an aspect of, uh, of Republicans uh, not wanting to do taxes. Later, when the Democrats do a larger reconciliation bill that will be mostly social spending, there will be tax hikes. Okay. And uh, if we can take a look at some of your uh, budget projections here, what are we looking at in this chart? Okay. So this chart, the, look, the key takeaway from this chart is what the arrow is showing, which is that in 2022 fiscal year, you actually do get a big withdrawal of government support. It's a fiscal drag or a, a shrinkage of the budget deficit. So in other words, the government support was at very high levels during the crisis. We're now kind of normalizing and you're seeing less government support. Now, the private economy is doing very well. Consumer confidence is extremely high. Business uh, capex is extreme, extremely high. So that should help tide over the economy. But the, the chart is telling you that regardless of what happens in Washington over the next few months, we do still have a, a big fiscal drag over the, next, uh, 20, uh, over the next 12 months. Okay. And this chart too. So this chart is just showing, you know, what happens later this year when the Democrats pass their giant bill, the reconciliation bill, assuming that the bipartisan infrastructure does pass, um, what happens if they don't hike taxes? Now, that's yeah. the distinction here, because you can see that would be an even more stimulative backdrop to the tune of 1% of GDP. So that's the red line you're seeing. So in other words, uh, so you would have a more stimulative uh, policy if the tax hikes don't make it into the final reconciliation bill. But I think we will see at least some tax hikes. And that and that means that we'll end up somewhere between the blue and the green line. Now, last point on that, that was relative to the Congressional Budget Office baseline, you see. So what we're saying is in an environment where government support is, is falling for the economy, uh, you could have a little bit more cushion if you did not increase taxes. Well, Matt, you mentioned that most of this would not, most of this infrastructure bill would not be financed, and it's going to add to the deficit and the debt level. Can we afford it? Is the question right now. We're already at close to thirty trillion dollars of national debt. This is the most on record. We're at a point where economists would mostly agree that uh, any increase in the interest rate would bankrupt the treasury because we would be unable to afford higher interest payments. So, is the infrastructure spending of five hundred fifty billion dollars um, really necessary? For a, from a budget perspective at this particular point? 
Uh, you know, that, that's a tough call because there is still a lot of uncertainty about the variants of the virus and how much that's going to affect economic activity uh, this fall. Hospitals are clogged right now. Uh, cases are exploding, in, especially in states with low vaccination rates. So uh, one dynamic we will see is that these bills are a lot more likely to pass Congress mm -hmm. if you get a, a new sense of crisis around the pandemic. Uh, but generally speaking, it's it's a, it's a strange world we live in. Can the U.S. afford this? Well, yeah, the U.S. can afford exorbitant spending and, and government largesse and has been doing so for a long time, uh, as long as the rest of the world continues to buy U.S. bonds and have faith in U.S. Uh, currency, which so far appears to be the case. And so that reflects the fact that the risks are even bigger globally in other places, despite the fact that the U.S. is fiscally in discipline. Have you done any research yourself? And of course, I know this is a very heated academic debate as well, but have you ever done any research um, on whether or not uh, uh, spending money is a more effective means of stimulating the economy versus lowering taxes, which is probably what uh, the Trump administration would, uh, would do? Yeah, so well, actually academics have done that research. Direct federal spending on, on infrastructure to build roads and bridges is gonna have the biggest bang for the buck. Now, you can argue about what that fiscal multiplier would be. Uh, and it also depends on how much slack there is in the economy. Today, there is still some slack in the economy. Uh, so infrastructure in that regard uh, could help to soak up, um, you know, what, you've got a labor shortage, but some of that is temporary. But then you also have people that can rejoin the workforce. So, you know, there's a lot to be debated there. But I think the takeaway is that when people... Um, when, when people are asking uh, the U.S. government to deliver, and we've seen this over the past 10 years, uh, Americans are more inclined to support a more fiscally profligate government. They're basically asking for the government to provide a baseline of support because they do not want to go back into a disinflationary environment because if you're an indebted household, yes. a disinflationary environment increases the real burden of your debt. And that's why, whether it was Trump or Biden, we saw a lot of impetus for uh, big spending and not much impetus for austerity. So, Matt, let's talk about the impacts on the economy of this infrastructure bill, specifically on growth. Let's talk about growth first, and we'll talk about inflation later. What do you think this bill is going to do to the unemployment rate, to wages, to the labor shortage problem that we have right now, and to growth overall? Well, th this infrastructure bill is is roughly 1.6% of GDP, uh, spread out over a long period of time. So it, it's a small amount of, of money. Uh, and, and it really depends on whether the Democrats pass their larger reconciliation bill, which the headline number is $3.5 trillion. Of course, it won't really be that big, but it could be $1.5 trillion uh, taken all together, infrastructure and the social spending. Uh, and now that's, of course, very substantial. So um, in that environment, you're going to have a bigger government go contribution to growth, given that consumers are uh, optimistic and that business is recovering and that the vaccines so far work, uh, you, you should have a positive uh, economic uh, outcome. You're not going to, you know, growth has peaked relative to the extreme bottoms of 2020 when we were all in lockdown, sure. but we're still going to have robust growth. Sure. Okay. And Biden has said that he does not expect this to exacerbate inflationary pressures. Would you agree with that statement? Mm, yeah, that, that kind of depends. I mean, th this bill itself may be limited in that regard. But the point here is that um, once you get over, uh, you know, we're going to rapidly get down to low unemployment rates because of all the stimulus and the, and the recovery from the pandemic. And at that point, you know, if, you, if the unemployment rate gets below 4% in the coming years, then, of course, you're going to have wage pressure. Uh, the big change in the world is that developed markets, including the United States, are willing to use the fiscal lever. And if you have extremely accommodated monetary policy and then you start utilizing the fiscal lever aggressively, you're going to supercharge growth. And there are capacity constraints that can be discovered in that process, uh, particularly with the labor market. So. Uh, you know, inflation definitely can make a comeback, even if in the short term, you know, it's moderating. Do you think the unemployment rate can come down? We're, t we're talking about a scenario in which um, many people would prefer to collect unemployment stimulus checks rather than uh, rather than uh, working their usual job. That's been that's been the case in some service sectors that we've observed. And so the argument here is that unless stimulus checks end people won't return to the workforce. So do you see that scenario happening? 
Well, there's some truth to that. Uh, and in some cases, it isn't rational if they're getting a bigger benefit from the government than they were in their very low wage job. Uh, but eventually, the the effects will be zoned out. Now, look, uh, as I said, if the pandemic ramps up because of a new variant that causes us to actually have Congress throw in a bunch of more relief mm -hmm. and extend these benefits, then, of course, that's going to prolong this labor shortage in those sectors. Uh, it would also you know, prolong this whole crisis environment in terms of people not wanting to go out and do things in the, in the service sector getting hit as a result. Uh, but, you know, when we look further down the road, eventually we're going to be getting out of this. And, uh, and it's an environment in which the benefits will dry up, particularly because the Republicans are likely to take the midterm, at least take the House of Representatives in the midterm election. Um, so you're not going to have the same kind of government configuration or the ability to extend benefits Eternally. And by the way, even many moderate Democrats don't want to keep these benefits going forever. Let's talk about the midterms in just a minute. But uh, I want to go back to inflation now. Uh, today on the 11th of August, we saw CPI numbers come in. 5.4 percent was the headline reading. It's the same number as June's. People are saying that inflation has already peaked. What do you think? Well, in the near term, yeah, it probably has. Uh, but again, that has to do with the fact that the economy is normalizing. Right. Um, so. I think the inflation discussion is is juggling two separate uh, issues, and it has to do with the time frame. Have we seen a structural change in aspects of U.S. policy that could be inflationary in the long run? Yes, we have, because we effectively have debt monetization taking place. We have policymakers who are extremely fearful of what they would deem populist rebellion, and therefore they're willing to spin their way out of that. And that applies to moderate Republicans as well as the Democratic Party. And remember, moderate Democrats also fear feeding their extreme left wing. So populism is on both sides. The political establishment is therefore willing to spend a lot more money. And we've witnessed this over several years. So we're just not in the same environment that we were back in 2011 in which um, austerity will take place. That's inflationary, especially if you couple that with restrictions on trade which, you know, we still have a, a trade war that's at least, you know, flat. It's lingering with China. We haven't had any uh, supply easing there. Uh, so basically, uh, you add those things together and you end up with an environment where mm -hmm. policy has taken a, a turn away from globalization and away from austerity. And those two things will limit, uh, you know, they, they will be inflationary on the margin. Okay, so we've talked about fiscal policy. Let's talk about uh, monetary policy now. The... Uh We've seen Congress finally do their part in stimulating the economy. Does the Fed need QE anymore, or can they start tapering soon? Yeah, the Fed is, uh, many of the Fed um, uh, governor members, or board members are talking about uh, tapering soon. It could begin as early as the beginning of uh, 2022. Um, and so I think that's, that's inevitable. Uh, and, and the issue that the markets have to deal with is, that you've kind of got good news still here, a window closing where the Fed is not tapering. Uh, you're going to get more stimulus. And this lasts until roughly the end of the year. But then uh, as soon as these tax hikes pass and we get to 2022, you're looking at taxes going up, tapering. Tapering is, of course, a prelude to eventual rate hikes, probably in 2023. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's still a lot of geopolitical risk and other factors. And so I think there's clouds forming on the horizon, even though in the near term, uh, we could probably see uh, some of the reflationary and cyclical trades uh, performing a little better. So uh, you mentioned to me offline that this fall we'll see a big congressional battle. What exactly are you referring to and what can investors expect? Yeah, so this is the battle of the Biden presidency uh, this fall because he's passing his biggest, his signature bill or trying to, but he only has a one seat margin in the Senate. So this can be a bloody battle in terms of getting this thing passed and all kinds of surprise events can take place when you have that thin of a margin. But the but remember, you won't be able to pass tax hikes or much of any significance in 2022 because of the midterm campaigning. And most likely you'll have gridlock after 2022. So in other words, the U.S. fiscal policy is going to be set in stone effectively until at least 2025 after this battle this fall, which means what happens this fall has a lasting effect on, on government role in the, in the economy and, and on markets. So I think it's going to be a huge battle. It has to do with the government shutdown risk, debt ceiling risk, et cetera. 
ultimately, um, people can't get everything they want. Republicans will not be able to have a national default on debt blamed on them for being obstructionist in a year in which they're also blamed by Democrats for, for supporting an insurrection, right? They, they, they cannot do that. So they will have to play ball on the debt ceiling, ultimately, um, and then me- at least get out of the way. And then meanwhile, the Democrats, they won't be able to get everything they want. There will be huge compromises on that reconciliation bill in order to get all 50 Democrats to vote in unison on it by the end of the year. What's the worst case scenario in, in, in which nothing gets passed, nothing gets uh, agreed upon? Oh, well, worst case scenario is government shuts down and the U.S. defaults on the national debt, right? That's wow. That's going to be very remi- reminiscent, but worse than what we witnessed in, in uh, 2011, et cetera. Uh, yeah. I think the dynamic is very different. As I said, I don't think Republicans are in a position with public opinion where they can get away with that. I think they have to be more um, more cooperative. And the bipartisan infrastructure deal shows that they know that. Uh, nevertheless, that is a risk, and we will see a lot of volatility this fall due to Washington. Okay, that, that's a key point, volatility. I remember in 2011, we saw plenty of volatility because of the, uh, uh, the worries around the debt ceiling not being raised. Investors, I, I would say, I'm looking around in the markets, they don't seem to believe that that is a likely scenario this time around. Otherwise, we'd be selling off already, right? Maybe people are pricing in the um, very, very low likelihood of this worst case scenario playing out. What do you think? Could be, but you know the market's uh, you know not paying attention to that right now. If if we sure. get into September and uh, House comes back into session and Pelosi says that she's not going to do the infrastructure deal at all unless the reconciliation bill gets passed, uh, then all of a sudden you could have people being afraid that everything's going to collapse. We'll get no more stimulus. Uh, there will be no cushion for that fiscal cliff that I pointed out. And then meanwhile, the Republicans could still drive a hard bargain on the government shutdown and debt ceiling. And I think that would all look pretty ugly in late September. I want to talk briefly about the um, American Families Act plan. So uh, there's talk from economists I've spoken to that uh, this administration is interested in implementing some sort of universal basic income. Do you see that playing out? And maybe are are the stimulus checks that they're doing right now kind of a prelude to that? No, I, I don't see. I don't think it has the pop, popular support in the U.S., but but I, I am arguing that the U.S. has taken a step up in terms of what kind of uh, government role and what kind of fiscal support is acceptable. So we have seen a shift, even a sea change in, in U.S. attitudes over the past decade. Uh, this is very clear in what the Democrats have been able to campaign on and get elected on and, and now push through. Um, they are putting through, you know, earned income tax credit, uh, child uh, tax credit. Uh, so there's a lot here to support households, uh, but I don't see it as being a universal basic income. Well, put it this way. Do you think uh, stimulus checks then, uh, forget UBI, do you think stimulus checks will end by September? It, it really depends on the virus. And that's not, you know, that's above my pay grade. You sure. have to bring in an epidemiologist. But look, one thing about the virus, I will say, uh, you know, we know a lot more than we knew in 2020. For most of 2020, we didn't know whether people would be able to create a vaccine. Well, scientists created a vaccine, right? And it is mostly effective. So uh, unless we get a variant that resists the vaccine, which, of course, is a risk, um, but also, you know, it's got to be more deadly or it's got to be more harmful to children. You know, there has to be a true change in the uh, fear factor. Otherwise, people are going to look through this because right now we're talking about the terrorist attacks that occurred after 9-11, right? The market generally tended to look through those. Okay. So now looking abroad, what other geopolitical risks outside of the U.S. should investors be paying attention to right now? Well, a big geopolitical risk is Iran because the U.S. was not able to piece together the 2015 nuclear deal in time for the, uh, before the new government took office in Iran. And the new government is much more of a hawkish government. It's a war hawk uh, president, Ebrahim Raisi. And it will lead to, uh, you know, red lines being drawn and saber rattling. And so I think this fall will actually see a lot of traditional geopolitical risk, meaning explosions in the Middle East. Uh, And that can push up the oil price. You know, we can have an oil risk premium injected if things get really hot and they could. Uh, Ultimately, there is a strong force for the U.S. and Iran to do a deal. And so if you're thinking more medium and long term, then the risks are still the U.S. and China conflict. I mean, that is the the epic uh, geopolitical conflict taking place in the world. And uh, as we've seen with the initial public offerings and, and uh, technology, 
Uh, there's there's a lot happening in that U.S. China front um, that can uh, that can surprise investors in a negative way, uh, even though at the moment people are are not necessarily paying attention to that aspect of it. I, I just want to close on a bigger idea here. I was having uh, dinner with a friend, and we were talking about U.S. Chinese uh, tensions. And he was saying that if you look back at history, whenever a great power was challenged by another great power, usually in the past that has led to armed conflict. What about this time? Yeah, so your, your friend is maybe referring to Graham Allison's a book, The Thucydides Trap, and he, and, and he found 75% of the time it leads to war. I would even highlight from my own study of history that it it's, may not be one war. Uh, you often will have multiple wars, especially when the two powers are maritime powers because they can fight naval skirmishes uh, that are relatively isolated uh, and, you know, from, from, say, total war. Uh, so in other words, the U.S. and China over the coming century could have more than one conflict, um, not to mention the fact that, yes, conflict is uh, likely to occur based on history. So it's incumbent on the politicians, the political leaders to avoid this. Um, and in that front, it's, you know, it's very tough. First of all, in the U.S., it's clear that we have a consensus by both parties that the U.S. dropped the ball for several years uh, while it was engaged in the Middle East, uh, didn't pay attention to China. So the U.S. is definitely looking to revive its strategic anchor in the Pacific. And that's going to happen no matter what. That's mm -hmm. going to put pressure on China and that's going to cause tensions. The other thing is uh, China itself, potential GDP is slowing. You need some form of legitimacy. It's been uh, leading to more nationalism and a more assertive foreign policy. And so that's going to cause tensions with the U.S. and, and China's neighbors that are allied with the U.S. So I see this as being a Thucydides trap, like Graham Allison said. I think it's a, effectively a Cold War, and it's going to be with us for a long time. Well, I argue with my friend that we're already in, engaged in some sort of conflict with China, but that conflict is purely economical. We've seen that with the Trump administration and what he's done already. And so I, would, I, I argue that armed conflict is no longer necessary in the 21st century and beyond between two great powers. Would you agree or disagree with that analysis? Well, there is mutually assured destruction. They're both nuclear powers. And so it is reminiscent of the Cold War in that respect. There are, of course, differences as well. And we could highlight those. China has a more sustainable economy than the Soviet Union did. I think the takeaway is that the region around China, mm -hmm. Asia, East Asia, has been known for business and stability for many decades, uh, relative geopolitical stability. Uh, well, that's changing in a big way because these conflicts from the 40s and 50s that were frozen in place, they're thawing now. And so suddenly, uh, you know, Taiwan matters again. Uh, Korea matters again. Philippine-U.S. relations matter again. Japan matters again. So basically, the Pacific is coming alive, and this is an area where geopolitical risk is substantial. Uh, it means that there are it means that China suffers big headwinds because China was the winner over the past several decades of, of kind of hyper globalization. All right. Well, uh, let's follow up uh, again and focus more on this topic. We can we can talk for a much, uh, much greater length at this. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for coming on the show today. Appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.